It's a huge honor and a pleasure to be back here this year, uh, having kicked off the uh, inaugural Energy Disruptors last year. Um, I'll try and do a similar thing, give you a little bit of a fact base, what's going on in energy and mobility and so on, tell a few jokes, have a bit of fun, and give you stuff to talk about over the next few days. Now, I didn't see when Holly asked, how many people are back from last year? Can we do that again? How many of you were here last year? OK, and how many new? The rest, presumably. OK, so we got more new. <laughs> you never know. You have to be very careful these days. So for those that were here last year, you'll recognize this. Uh, we had a bit of fun. I used this kind of poem to open things up. The same words read different ways, which reinforce either whether we can or can't shift to a clean energy future. And that's going to be a pretty hard act for me to top, but I'll try. For those of you who were not here, what we did was, what I did in the keynote, was to really say, look, there's these two different ways of looking at the world. This is one of them. We're going to go to 100% renewable energy. It's going to be easy. The only thing holding it back is a few bad people who are trying to hang on to the past. And the other point of view, this is a great Canadian, Václav Smil, the great hope for a quick and sweeping transition to renewable energy is wishful thinking. So I took that really as the starting point that you have these extreme positions, but where you, who work every day in the energy space, in mobility, in technology, in policy and so on, where you are, where you work, is somewhere between those two. And I tried to bring things together. I tried to give you a fact base, an assumption about the future, which I called the three-third world. One-third of electricity will be wind and solar. More than half of it, by 2040, will be zero carbon, because you've got to add nuclear and biomass and geothermal globally. But one third will be very cheap, but variable, and zero marginal cost. And we talked about some of the implications. One third of vehicles will be electric, not sales. Sales will be more than half, but one third of vehicles that we see on the streets around us will be electric. And the economy will be one third more energy productive. So I laid that out last year, and what I thought we could do usefully, part of the time, today, is to review it and see, well, what has changed, if anything? So first of all, investment. You know, we saw that investment had grown in these clean energy solutions, renewables, energy efficiency, smart grid, power storage, carbon capture and storage, not much of that, was that it soared from very low levels, 15 years ago, reached about 350 billion a year. That's one dollar in every six invested in energy. You add investment in the grid, you get to about a dollar in three that's in clean energy and electricity. But then it stalls, 350 billion, just over a third of a trillion per year, big money, but it's no longer increasing. Although installations of renewable energy are increasing. What's happened since? Well, there you see it. Another year, no increase of investment, still lots of installations of renewable energy, but no breakout year. No breakout year for investment in clean energy. Last year, Disruptors 2018, I talked about these record low prices for wind and solar and offshore wind. Two cents US per kilowatt hour. This is the world record. But it's the cheapest electricity ever produced by any technology anywhere in the history of the planet is now coming from renewables, I said. What's happened since? 
even cheaper. New records established. Offshore wind at five US cents, below five US cents. Think about the volume of offshore wind real estate that is out there. Let's take a moment. T. Boone Pickens sadly passed away very recently. He understood, he understood that this would happen. that wind and solar would get cheap. And it was a kind of real estate type of business, annuities. But I love this quote from him. Lost my ass on wind energy. Not wrong, just early. And last year, we looked at how conventional energy forecasters have missed the trend. Do you remember this? On the left, you've got additions in solar capacity. On the right, you've got cumulative. This is the IEA, International Energy Agency, my very good friends. You could do the same chart, and we have, based on any of the conventional energy forecasters, EIA, any of the oil companies, etc. And what did we see? Do you remember this? 14 times in a row, they had to increase their forecasts for both installations and cumulative capacity in solar, and it's not different in wind. What happened in the last year? Can you guess? Anybody think they got it right? Not one hand gone up. Correct. Same again. The world has still not realized how transformational these trends are. Last year, Disruptors 18, I told you that coal had pretty much peaked. What happened since then? Actually, a bit of a resurgence. The economy has been so strong globally. China has been so determined to stimulate its economy in the face of the trade troubles that we've seen this bulge in coal production. And we have to ask the question, is this now the new long-term trend or is it a blip? Capacity utilization in coal we talked about this last year. It had dropped. It's stabilized in a few countries. It has not turned around. It has not returned to the levels that we've seen historically. The profitability of coal-fired power around the world is very, very poor. Investment in coal, maybe it's stabilized. These are 50% down on its peak. We're not about to see a rapid return to growth in the use of coal. There's one person who thinks we might, or we should, or maybe even we have. Who knows? This is a quotation from July 2017, President Trump. Everyone was saying, well, you won't get any mining jobs. We picked up 45,000 mining jobs. I think we looked at this last year. There were no 45,000 new mining jobs. In fact, there were no new coal mining jobs. What happened since? Flatline. No resurgence of coal in the US. The number of new coal-fired power stations being built in the US is still zero. While we're fact-checking, we can fact-check another claim about the energy sector. That's this one. They say the noise from wind farms causes cancer. Wind farm cancer. There you've got some things 
that do not cause cancer and some things that do. But seriously, let's come a little bit closer to home. Natural gas, that was coal. Are we seeing the age of gas? Those are the decisions, final investment decisions for gas-fired generation globally. Doesn't look like much of an age of gas when investment decisions are dropping. What is happening? The answer is gas is losing out to energy efficiency, to very cheap renewables. Bloomberg New Energy Finance, the team that I founded, I now just am a contributor, I write for them, but I still think these are the best long-term outlooks for energy on the market. I trained the team. And you can see there on the left, coal is going to be forced off the system. And gas will grow, but it won't be the age of gas. Why? Because if you look at a CCGT, the big plants that run preferably 24-7, then wind and solar and a combination are simply cheaper. And when you look at OCGT, which is used for peaking to deal with the variability and the volatility, well, guess what? Batteries are becoming cheaper. We're seeing investments in batteries. There you can see grid scale, really big batteries, and then behind the meter, the stuff that is in maybe a building like this, to enable it to smooth out peaks in demand so it's not hit with huge charges for the peak of its requirements. Grid scale storage behind the meter, $4 billion of investment in the last year, growing very rapidly. But that's still a small figure compared to this. Here you can see all the batteries, not just the ones that are connected to the grid, not just the stationary ones, the big chunk of batteries that we're going to see installed in the future are going to be in vehicles. You can see there the stationary storage is this little tiny piece, and the vehicles, the big piece. For those of you who are tech mavens, entrepreneurs, technologists, we have to get that vehicle storage to a place where it's useful for the grid to deal with variability. If we don't, we have to build vast amounts of new generating capacity. As everybody plugs in their cars, their trucks, etc., at the same time. And if we do, the transition becomes a whole lot easier, enormous opportunity. So last year, I encouraged you to think about these clean energy technologies in terms of doublings, the way technologists think about things, not the way that resource economists, people who dig things out of the ground, build pipelines, etc., think about things. Think about them like technologists. You'll think in terms of doublings. And wind, we had four doublings over 17 years, and solar, we had eight doublings. Where are we today? Almost five doublings of wind, almost nine of solar, and it's the doublings that drive down the costs. Those cost reductions are not going to stop. And we've reached the point now 
where wind and solar, not all renewables, just, just wind and solar, the stuff that we said would be one third of electricity by 2040, today it's somewhere around 8.5%. Last year, it would have been probably 7%. 8.5%, very cheap, but variable, and zero marginal cost. Extremely disruptive. So that's what's been going on around the world. And I would like to think that here in Canada, having listened to essentially the same story last year, that all of you would have gone out and invested time and money in clean energy. But sadly, that's not what's happened here in Canada. There you can see quarterly investments. So the peak in Canada was around 7 billion US per year back in 2012, 13, 14. And I was struggling to see this huge surge of investment activity that followed Energy Disruptors 2018. But you know, this is Energy Disruptors 2019. Maybe the future will be different than the past. But let's move on and talk about vehicles. The one-third that I told you last year would be electric by 2040. How have we been doing? Well, the numbers are growing. The numbers are growing, and they're growing worldwide. Although less than 1% of the vehicles worldwide are electric, around 2% of new sales. And this sounds like a small number, 2%. What's 2%? Well, I'll tell you. When you think about logistic curves, penetration curves, one technology penetrating into another, flat screen TVs into tube TVs, that sort of penetration, then I'll tell you what happens. The first 1% takes forever. Going from 1% to 5%, it's like waiting for a sneeze. And then 5% to 50% goes really fast. And that's when you see the bankruptcies, and that's when you see the restructurings. And in this vehicle transition, we're now at 2% of sales. We talked about the experience curve in batteries. And there you can see internal combustion, the yellow line, the columns is the price of an electric car. 2016, the electric car was so expensive, only Leonardo DiCaprio could afford one. Prices are coming down, the battery is getting cheaper. Sometime soon, 2022 to 2026, you will see the sticker price, the showroom price, the upfront price crossing over. If you're a fleet operator, or you're the sort of person that puts all your car costs onto a spreadsheet, and I don't count myself amongst those, the crossover is happening now. And that's why we go from taking forever to waiting for the sneeze to very rapid penetrations up to the 50% mark. Model availability. We're starting to see the mainstream models, the Fords, the Volkswagens, the Daimlers and so on coming through. There will be hundreds of models, models to suit everybody. Personally, I'm waiting for the Dyson. <laughs> I like the idea of a car that cleans up after itself. 
But you know, over the last year, we've also learned some other things about the electrification of transport. Of course, it's not just cars, two-wheelers, three-wheelers, mainly two-wheelers, but also buses, and that crossover point where electric beats internal combustion has already happened for any urban bus fleet. Commercial vehicles. We're seeing a better range of vehicles with better range. From small vans, medium size, larger vehicles, and we're going to be seeing a whole lot of those strange things that you see on the right. Delivery robots, maybe not drones so much, but robots on our pavements. What we're seeing is that people accept them. They trundle along, delivering pizza. People don't freak out. We're going to see a lot more of those. Not just cars, also works vehicles of varying sorts: forklift trucks, tractors, diggers, garbage trucks. Garbage trucks. What a fabulous use case! Has anybody here? Ever been woken up by a garbage truck? Exactly, silent trucks. Ships. Not every ship goes 5,000 nautical miles. There's an awful lot of ferries, and coastal freighters, and tenders, and even the bigger ships right now are already. Hybrid, which means if you're concerned about air pollution near ports, the obvious answer is to carry some batteries. And then aviation. Of course, we see lots of news stories about flying taxis. I'm not very keen on flying taxis. I don't like the idea. Of a Goldman Sachs banker flying over my house, it might be the day I buy a shotgun. <laughs> But we're seeing these sorts of aircraft going through the design process. Larger aircraft, 300 miles, 500 miles, 1,000 miles, and beyond that, they will be hybrids as well, electric motors. And why? Just like garbage trucks, these things will be quieter. They'll be able to use the runway earlier in the morning, later at night. Shorter runways because electric motors have got such great torque. And when they're up in the air, you can shut down some of the electric motors, and you can cruise, and it's more efficient. And if it's more efficient, the airlines. We'll all buy them, and that's where we're headed. Now, the oil companies have spotted this. The European oil companies, in particular, have started to acquire and invest in electrification in a pretty major way. In technology companies. In generation assets, generation platforms, trading and retailing, because they understand that trading electricity and trading fossil fuels, and trading carbon, and trading other environmental credits, is a growth business. And EV charging. So the European majors, all of them, are engaging in this shift of their asset base towards, not to, but towards, a more electric transportation future. And that trend, that trend could be about to accelerate considerably.
We don't know how this is going to play out. We're all being educated this week in the vulnerability of the fossil fuel supply chain. Last year, we met this chap. It's the world's best oil price forecaster. And all I would say is he's going to have a busy year. But at this point, there's usually somebody, there's usually lots of people in the audience going, yeah, but you know what? What he's missing is hydrogen. Electric vehicles, they're not a direct replacement. It's all going to go to hydrogen. And let me tell you, it's not. Not hydrogen cars. Hydrogen elsewhere in the economy, but not cars. This is the growth in battery electric vehicles that we've already seen and drawn to scale. Hydrogen vehicles, drawn to scale. And if I came back at Energy Disruptors 2029, that chart will look the same. The scale will have changed. The chart will not have changed. Why? Let's look at two vehicles. One is the Tesla Model 3, and one is the hydrogen competitor, the Toyota Mirai. Similar looking cars, similar weight, similar range. And let's look at this not through the perspective of a technocrat, an analyst, an energy industry specialist, somebody who lives this stuff every day. Let's just look at it through the decision made by somebody who might actually be buying a car. Well, of course, if you're on the road, you're driving hundreds and hundreds of miles, you want to pull in and refuel, well, the fuel cell car's got it. Three minutes instead of 30 minutes. It's a no-brainer. But look at all the other factors. The battery electric vehicle is cheaper. It's got five seats, not four. Why? Because it's not full of hydrogen tanks. You can fold the seats down and get loads of luggage in the back, again, because you haven't got hydrogen tanks. It accelerates to 60 miles an hour in 4.4 seconds. You don't have to be a speed freak to know that that is better and safer, if used appropriately, than a car that takes nine seconds. Most of the time, 48, 50 weeks a year, you'll refuel the car at home or at the office or at the mall, and it will take you less than a minute to plug it in and walk away, and you never have to go to a filling station, except on those longer journeys. The drivetrain is simple, the maintenance cost will be lower, and then the last one is wind to wheel, electricity to driving somewhere. The fuel cell car requires two chemical conversions. Half of the electricity is lost. It's a really stupid solution. Now, that doesn't mean hydrogen is stupid, not at all. You've got here the experience curve, just as we've seen in wind, just as we've seen in solar, just as we've seen in batteries, driving down the costs of hydrogen. Right? Hydrogen electrolysis. And where we're going, right now, of course, it's more expensive to make hydrogen from electricity than it is from natural gas. Steam methane reforming beats electrolysis. But it won't stay that way. 2030, the best big electrolysis projects will start to be competitive. By 2050, game over. But that hydrogen will be used in the economy to deal with seasonality, power generation, ammonia, in refineries, for longer distance transportation perhaps, for aircraft perhaps, for ships, just not in urban transportation. Now, last year, we didn't talk much 
about the energy efficiency piece, that one third more energy productive. And actually, becoming one third more energy productive in 20 years or so is not an outlier. It's not a provocative statement of any sort. What you can see there is GDP will more than double, final energy will go up, and the amount of energy required per unit of GDP will improve by around a third. This is the trend. This has been happening for quite some time. You know, in last year, we looked at some of the kind of cool innovations in heat, and there are a lot of them. And it's an exciting area. And last year, I talked to entrepreneurs, some of whom may be back this year, who are working on smarter ways of heating homes and offices and factories and industrial processes. But in the intervening year, there was one thing that I learned that I want to share with you because I, OK, I'm a thermodynamics geek, but I think this is incredibly exciting. Air conditioner sales versus heat pumps. See, I told you I'm a thermodynamics geek. But what we see is heat pumps significantly outgrowing air conditioner sales. Now, the scale is 10 times smaller. So 10 times fewer heat pumps than air conditioning units. But if we see a shift of heating from furnaces and boilers to heat pumps, we're seeing the electrification of heat. That will help in all sorts of ways, not just that electricity is cleaner, but also heat. It's a great way to smooth out some of that volatility coming from wind and solar. It's a lot cheaper to store hot water than electrons. And we're starting to see solutions like hybrid heat pumps. So most of the time, you'll use your heat pump, electrical heating, and when you have that very cold period, we talked about it last year, the beast from the east, it's called in the UK, when you get that cold snap, you'll go back to gas. So still a market for gas but much smaller, and the whole system will be working to smooth out volatilities and fluctuations. Another exciting development, important development globally, is this. Middle-income developing countries, we all know there's going to be surging energy demand from the developing world. There already is. And the average middle-class home in a developing country, 3,000 watt-hours per day. But it's perfectly possible to meet that need with 1,000 watt-hours per day. Think of the entrepreneurial opportunities. There is both the need and the opportunity in serving this market. Now, another area we didn't talk enough about last year was digitization. When it comes to the efficiency of using energy, digitization is our friend. We're moving into a world of ubiquitous sensors, ubiquitous communications, ubiquitous processing, storage, ubiquitous machine learning, and the ubiquitous ability for machine-to-machine -machine financial transactions using distributed ledgers. We didn't talk about it enough last year. Driverless cars, clearly a massive, important trend. Last year, there was a driverless racing car here. So I felt well, you have other people more smarter, better informed than me uh, to listen to during the two days. And it remains one of the trends that will decide our energy use and our lifestyle out into the future. And once again, I'm left thinking, well, 
There's going to be an amazing agenda and speakers. You're probably better off listening to them than to me. But I will raise one question. Here you've got John Krafczyk, CEO of Waymo, Waymo, the most advanced driverless car operation in the world, saying it'll be decades before autonomous cars are widespread on the roads. And even then, they won't be able to drive themselves in all conditions. And somehow I feel that the conditions he's talking about that will be difficult for these cars might be slightly more prevalent in the UK or in Canada than in California. So be skeptical, but listen to the amazing speakers that you have here in the next couple of days on this issue of driverless cars and machine learning. So that's a tour of the three-third world, an update from last year. I hope that you find the narrative still works. We also said that we need to go beyond the three-third world. If we're going to address climate change, we have to get into the difficult stuff. Shipping, freight, manufacturing, chemicals, agriculture and heat. And we have to do it whilst bringing those who don't have access to electricity, 900 million of them, and those still burning wood and charcoal and dung. We have to bring them into the world of modern energy surf services. Now, in the intervening time since last year's energy disruptors, there was this report from the IPCC, the 1.5 degrees report. Paris said we should try to keep below, well below two degrees. And this report, which is very thick, very authoritative, based on peer-reviewed science said, limiting to 1.5 degrees is possible, blah, 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 blah. Much too long a report to read, so I thought what I would do is summarize it for you. Okay? So all the things that we're doing, we're trying to pretend are not bad for the planet, we now know are. And there are lots of solutions, but crossed fingers, we will invest enough in them. Now, when it comes to Canada, People are concerned. People are concerned about this stuff. 65% think that Canada should be doing more. 75% will make changes. 38% think our very survival depends on it. But only 30% would change the vehicle they drive. 25% would fly less frequently. And only half would spend more than $100 a year. That's how much a Netflix subscription costs. But in case any of you are thinking that this is a given, that people are concerned generically but they'll never do something, remember every so often there are black swans. And I was talking to some fossil fuel executives, some automotive executives, and I was saying, well, there's only three black swans, which they called the three Fs, three black swans that have happened during my whole career, 15 years, tracking this stuff. Fracking, Fukushima, and Elon Musk. <laughs> they thought that was pretty funny. But there is now another black swan a potential game changer. Not just Greta Thunberg, but social acceptance. She says, I want you to panic. 
how quickly could we be wrong-footed by these trends? We've talked about the sneeze. Look at this. Vehicle sales in Norway, from less than 5% to 50% plug-ins in six years. Indoor lighting, less than 5% to 40% LEDs in six years. 5% coal-fired generation in the UK to almost none in six years. Václav Smil is right. Things are slow, energy is big. But in individual technologies, market sectors and countries, things can go really, really quickly. Now, at the end of last year's keynote, I left you with this. I said, if we want things to stay as they are, everything will have to change. And as I was coming here, I thought, I have to think of something as profound, as deep as that to leave you with. And I was panicking because I hadn't thought, I couldn't imagine what it would be. How can I help provide you something that gives you a little bit of direction, something to talk about around the M&Ms and the coffees? Couldn't think of anything. And I was on my way here. I was at Heathrow when suddenly it hit me in the face. If you're facing disruptive change, if you know that the future is going to be different, that you're going to have to change everything about your operation just to maintain your way of life, your business, face the direction of travel. Thank you. <laughs>